good morning. Good to see you again after the break. Hope you enjoyed it. I did. Now, I gave you the link to this story. Actually, the link was not okay, but I corrected the link right uh, a minute ago. To this uh, story from this morning, I read it over the breakfast quite early this morning before coming here. Um, so I thought we should have a look at that. Not today. As I say, I give you two weeks of preparation time now. So you have plenty of time to prepare yourselves. I realize this is Danish, but I explain in my message what it's about. 51 Danish university teachers claims, they say, that uh, the students are so poorly prepared for the teaching that it really has a severe negative effect on the activity going on. Do you feel... What do you think? Is that a fair thing to say? Well, we'll not have the discussion today. I'll, in two weeks from now, two or three weeks, I'll hear you again. What do you think of this? I mean, I didn't do any computations. I just realized that there is something at least we can think about. I gave you the more exact numbers in the message. You don't see them in the internet version. You can see them in the paper version, which I saw this morning at my house. Um, so. Have a look at it and uh, think about whether you agree what they say. On the other hand, you could think the other way around. I wonder if you made a survey among students whether you would get a 100% uh, perfect teaching response uh, throughout uh, our university landscape. That's another way of looking at it. Anyway, um, you can have a look and, I mean, uh, at least be intelligent about thinking about what you can learn from these numbers or maybe not learn. Have a look. We'll get back to this in a couple of weeks from now. Related to this, of course, would be surveys of uh, whether Obama or the other guy will win the election in the US. So we'll get back to that also in a couple of weeks. Today's topic is the following. Hypothesis tests, and in fact, conference, confidence intervals for two means. I have put into the main presentation of today, that's the first part, a repetition of something we have learned before we went on break. I thought that would be a good idea to remind ourselves what have we learned so far, and we'll take move on from there, not to only be able to study one mean at a time, which was what we've been taught so far, but today we'll focus on how to compare two means and some details on that. We'll see the story when we get there. Now, we'll look at chapter 8 and parts of chapter 7. Um, at the end, we'll discuss something related to how these two means actually appear. There are two, basically two different ways the two means can appear to us. We'll get back to that. So, let's go to the repetition. Now, a number of slides, which are copies of slides from previous uh, weeks, the last two weeks. When we do hypothesis testing, that is like checking an assumption or a conjecture or a claim or a hypothesis, a null hypothesis, about the, you could say, the real world out there. The null hypothesis is expressed like this. We claim, we say, we postulate that the mean is equal to some fixed number, mu zero. And then we have some alternative for that. And the burden of proof when we start looking at our data is on, you could say, H naught, meaning that we should sort of prove against the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So we have to prove the alternative uh, correct in a way to be, or I should say, we have to prove the null wrong. That's the kind of the way we think here. To, to actually achieve something, we must prove that the null hypothesis is wrong, is to be rejected. That's where we have some really valuable information. So we say that we either reject the null hypothesis or we accept it. The acceptance word is a bit dangerous 
but uh, nevertheless, we sort of use it. We just need to understand it properly. There are some rules of thumb. Usually, we use the equal sign uh, in the null. And in the alternative, we can use either this two-sided not equal or one of the two possible one-sided cases. So either we are in a situation where we want to prove that it's not like this. It could be either too small or too large. Or we know already that was the two-sided. Or we know already that we're going to prove too small. Or in the third situation, that we're going to prove too large. I mean, we cannot be in any, we cannot be in two or three situations at the same time. In a given situation, we are only in one of those three possible cases. There are three possible cases. The two-sided, the one-sided to the left, the one-sided to the right. right. Three different situations we can be in. We are only in one of those each individual time we do this. And we have to decide which in which one we are. Or we have to realize, and decide sounds as if we can decide it ourselves. We have to find out, we have to realize uh, which is the most proper uh, situation to use. Now, when we do hypothesis testing, there are two ways we can be correct, and there are two ways we can be wrong, right? If we reject when we must reject, then we're OK. If we accept when we should accept, we're OK. That's the two correct decisions. Then there are two possible ways of making a mistake here also. We may actually reject the null, even though it's true. That is, we claim someone guilty. We claim we found something. We claim we found a better treatment for cancer, for instance. But the truth is really that we did not find any better thing. It wasn't better. We just decided, given the data we had, that it was better. That's a type 1 error. The other error is that we might not be able to reject the null, even though we should. I mean, even though the cancer treatment really is better, then we do not realize it. So we, we, we would accept the fact that the new one is not better than the old one. So that's a non-rejection. That's a type 2 error. Right? And there are some prob probabilities or risks, you could say, of making those errors. And the intelligent part of doing hypothesis testing is realizing these risks <clears throat> and to be specific about what the risks are. We cannot remove the risks. I mean, even though we would love to and dream of that, the risks cannot be removed, but we can face them openly. That's the intelligent part, right? We call them alpha and we call them beta. And that's actually used as a global notation. I mean, alpha and beta are used for many things out there. But within statistics, the alpha and beta are used for those risks. Sometimes people even denote the alpha risk and beta risk, uh, sort of uh, understood that it's a type 1 and type 2 risk that we are uh, talking about. Now, an example of formulating hypotheses. Some ambulance company claims that, on average, they take 20 minutes from a telephone call to the switchboard until an ambulance is at location. Let's hope we are talking about non-acute calls here, non-acute cases. Otherwise, 20 minutes is a pretty large thing. In the Copenhagen area, the acute ones are six, seven, eight minutes, the median around that. Um, anyway. Now, if we want to check them, if we want to uh, check whether they are OK, of course, we'll start looking at how long time it takes. So we will have some measurements of how long does it take for an ambulance to appear at the location. Uh, the null would be the claim by the company. And if we want to check them as kind of uh, see if they're OK on what they say, I would say the alternative in this case would be that we would like to try to prove above. I mean, if, they're, if we cannot prove above, they're OK. And to be very specific on the two kinds of errors in this case, now I just repeat, in a way, the, the thinking about those errors, but putting it into this particular case of the ambulances here. We might do a type 1 error, which is reject the null, even though it's true. That is. 
we could mistakenly conclude that it takes longer than 20 minutes, even though if we had full information. I mean, the, the reason why we do the mistake is because we, we'll, we'll do the, the decision based on maybe 10 or 20 measurements, right? But the truth would be having a million measurements. Then we would know the truth about what's going on, right? But with 10 or 20, we may make a mistake. We may make the mistake that we claim that they are wrong. This is the mistake we want to protect ourselves pretty harshly against, right? Because that's a rather severe mistake to make. I mean, like if you have a contract with an ambulance company, you might have put into the contract that if they don't live up to the contract, they will be fined or they will have to pay some kind of money for not living up to the contract agreement. That is something that you agree on in, in contracts. And then if you agree on the risk level of the test that you're going to make when you're going to check whether it's okay, then, of course, it's a, it's a tough error to make that suddenly the ambulance company should pay a million dollar fine because they don't live up to what they, they claim if it's not really true, right? Uh, that's a, that's a, and, and in other contexts, the error can be even more severe. Um, so we don't want to make that mistake. We put that risk, the overall global decided risk level is, is 5%, alpha 5%. That's the most used risk level. Smaller risk levels can be used, uh, but it doesn't come for free, as we will return to later today. 5%, even though 5%, you could say, if, if, the, if the price for making a type 1 error is really, really high, a 5% risk is a pretty high risk, right? Would you want to play Russian roulette with the 1 out of 20 in... in in, in, in the gun you're holding at your head? I, I wouldn't. At least not until you finish the bottle of vodka or something. But then, again, you shouldn't. That's then your, your risk, uh, your risk uh, judgment that, that goes away there. You shouldn't do it, right? So it, it, it depends. Even nevertheless, we use 5% throughout. It's just to say we use 5%. But, I mean, it's, it's really a risk. I mean, it's not like it, it, it saves us from any kind of uh, mistakes out there. We make a mistake in one out of 20 cases. Um, the type 2 risk is the other one, which is a mistake we do a lot in our lives. This is where we have to get used to living. I mean, in a way, our going through life is one big type 2 error, in a way. And, like... Type 2 errors is that you have to accept things as they are uh, when you don't know better, right? If you cannot prove there is anything, you just have to accept that you cannot prove it. So I just have, have to accept. If, if they claim like that, if I cannot prove differently, I have to accept it. And I mean, there are many things we have to accept through life that we haven't proved wrong, right? So, so this is a kind of error. It's also an error which are more difficult to handle in practice. How much, some of, the, some of the studies that are mostly discussed in the media sometimes are studies that don't find anything. Like the big cellular phone study I mentioned previously in Denmark that didn't find any uh, increased risk uh, of cancer for people having used cellular phones. But how much have you then proven just because you didn't find anything? Generally speaking, that's where we should be careful with the word acceptance. Generally speaking, you should say, only because you cannot reject, only because you have to accept, is really not a proof of nothing being there. It's just a, a matter of fact that you couldn't find it. Then you'd have to use a confidence interval to be more specific about what you don't know, actually. <laughs> but that's a difficult task, and the type 2 error is often missed in a discussion in the media. That's simply too complicated. Now, we choose level of significance, most often 5%, but we could sometimes use smaller risks. We formulate hypotheses. We calculate the test statistic. Now we look at the data. So we have the hypothesis. We have the alpha given sort of by the situation. Now we look at the data. Then. Have, looking at the data takes us to either finding the p-value. The p-value expresses, you could say, the oddness of the data 
in relation to the null claim. On the other hand, if the null claim is true, how likely would the data be as odd as they came out? So, the, the, uh, another way of saying it, I measure how far away from the null claim is my data, right? I think naively that's what we should do. Here is the null, here is the data. Is the data far away from the null? I will reject. If I'm close to the null, I accept. I think that makes sense, right? How should we quantify whether we are close to the null or far away from the null? That's where we use probability theory. Because we need some idea of what is a natural, there will be a natural variability in the system. And that's where the theory comes in and tells us, what is the distribution to use? What is the kind of probability model to use to make a claim here about whether I'm close to or far away? Well, if I'm, when I know the distribution, the sampling distribution of whatever I'm looking at, then I can say, if I'm far away, I'm, it's very unlikely to be so far away in the distribution that I'm using. And so, a far away gives small p-values, and small p-values leads to rejection of the hypothesis. That's where we compare the p-value with the 5%. With the if the p-value becomes below 5%, we say, I don't believe in the null, I reject the null, right? Far away from the null gives small p-values. Small p-values leads to rejection of the null. I don't believe in the null. Alternative, we can, before looking at the data, actually go check in, this, in the same distribution and go check where is the sort of the unlikely limit, right? Where is the 5% limit? So if I'm within this limit, I accept. If I'm beyond this limit, I reject. That's the sort of uh, critical value approach of doing the same thing. We have these two sort of detailed way of finishing off the story. Last slide of the repetition. A slide that now takes the confidence interval into this. A lot of uh, thing on the hypothesis testing. Here is the confidence interval that I gave you before I gave you the hypothesis testing. Now, there is a claim that I also gave you two weeks ago here saying that when I have a confidence interval, let's look, the confidence interval is a method. You can, we can plug in numbers and we get an interval, right? What are the numbers? The numbers is the average, and then plus minus the same thing, namely the standard deviation divided by root n times this, you could call it a generalized two. It's not the number two in our minds we can think of plus minus two, but then the, why, the reason why we say plus minus two is because in the standard normal case, the 97% the point is 1.96, in a T distribution, it's slightly larger than two, typically. So we, we can think of this as, as a two, but we find the proper two in the statistical table, typically a bit larger than two. So the average plus minus twice the sampling uncertainty of the average. The average plus minus the maximal error. That's the confidence interval. We just plug in the mean and the standard deviation. We find the, the T percentile, the critical value, actually, and then we have this interval. Now, there is a link, nice link between the confidence interval and the hypothesis test. And here, let me just, I go to the bottom of my presentation to make a bit of support of this. CI and hypothesis test. I claim it would be a short one, but it's almost a mathematical proof, but just to make it very clear here. If I have a mu zero within the confidence interval, I start with the confidence interval. Here's the confidence interval, x bar plus minus the x bar minus the maximal error t times s over root n. Now, if I have a mu naught, mu zero, which is inside the interval, that's, let us think of a value which is inside the interval. What does that mean? I would say that it means that the mu naught is closer to x bar 
mu zero is closer to x bar than this maximal error. Hope you can follow me there. I'm expressing in mathematical terms that a value is inside the confidence interval. That is that it's closer to x bar than the limits of the confidence interval, right? It's closer to x bar than the limits of the confidence intervals. Now, I'm almost there, because if I simply put, if I say x bar minus mu zero over s over root n is less than or equal t, then I could take, uh, we could make it a 95% confidence interval and say 0.025 here, 0.025. What do I have here? Here is the t-test statistic from the hypothesis test, right? Are we out again? Good. <laughs> I mean, one thing is that I have to hear it while I say it, but hear myself more than once, that's too much for, for at least for me. <laughs> um, here is the t-test statistic simply written out, right? So, here is a situation where mu naught is accepted, right? Because mu, the test statistics is smaller than the critical value, and then I should actually, if we should be exact about it, it's accepted versus the alternative, the two-sided alternative. So, the confidence interval is equivalent to the two-sided hypothesis test. The confidence interval is equivalent to the two-sided hypothesis test. 100% equivalent in this case. Meaning, what I'm stating on my slide, if I go back to the slide, It means that the confidence intervals, the, the confidence interval is exactly those values that we accept by the hypothesis test, the two-sided version of the hypothesis test. And the values outside are the ones that we reject. So the confidence interval tells us the full hypothesis test story about all possible values. That's a pretty strong thing to use. If I should choose any of the two, I would always go for the confidence interval. Confidence intervals are used much too less compared to hypothesis tests. People seem to be f sometimes much too focused on hypothesis tests and p-values. Uh, but in many ways, the confidence interval is, is more intelligent. Especially also for those cases where we do not reject. That's what I claimed before. When we do not reject, the p-value information is useless. It, we can only say, I don't reject. I don't know anything else but that. So that's why we should, sometimes it's nice to know both, both the p-value for a relevant test and the confidence interval. Of course, so the, if the p-value is very, very small, it does provide additional information that we are very, very certain about this conclusion that we're going to make. This only goes for very small p-values. You should be careful here. Large p-values we cannot use for any sort of con conclusive things. If I conduct an experiment with only two cancer patients and test one uh, uh, treatment versus another treatment, I will get a p-value of around one because I cannot for sure prove nothing with only two patients. A p-value of, of around one is a proof of nothing. However, if I get a p-value of 0.0000001, it's a stronger proof than a p-value of 0.004. Here, that's, a, that's a point to make here. We can use size of p-values, but only if they are small, not if they are large. If they are large, they tell us nothing. It's a difficult thing maybe to understand fully, but it's an important thing in, in the way we should interpret these things. OK, that was an extended recap of confidence intervals and hypothesis test, as it is given for a single mean computation, as we have been focusing on so far. Simplest case, but that's where we should introduce the new concept. So that makes sense to me. Um, good. <clears throat>